Hello world, I'm Nick Proud and today we're going to look at Benchmark.net. We're going to look at how you can track your code's performance with Benchmarks using this amazing library. Before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. It's a huge help and it will help me bring more .NET content. So let's start by answering the question, what is Benchmark.net? Benchmark.net is a library written to allow you to take code you've written and analyze its performance. The library will transform this code into benchmarks and then use that to track its performance across the code base. It will also share those analytical results in extremely verbose, sometimes really verbose results, as you can see here. For me, I'd say the main use case for benchmark.net is to understand where there may be some inefficiencies in your code. You could look at it as a way of identifying bottlenecks. But I think for the most part, it's about trying to squeeze out as much performance as possible. Also, if you're unsure about whether you should be using one version of a method over another, then you could use benchmark.net to quickly find out which method is the more efficient. So let's take a look quickly at how benchmark.net works. So here in benchmark.net's documentation, they've outlined exactly the steps that are taken whenever you run a benchmark against your code. So essentially you have a sort of engine called a benchmark runner, and that will take a project and it will actually generate a new version of it with uh, all the runtime settings that you've got, and it will build it in release mode. Benchmark.net runs what it calls jobs against your code. So it will take each of the jobs and then it will measure its performance using this benchmark process. It will run this process several times and benchmark.net knows this as a launch count. So if you specified that you wanted to have a launch count of five, then benchmark.net will take all of the jobs and load them five times. Now, actually benchmarking the code you want to check is called an operation. And the collective term for operations is iteration. So these are all things that you can manage as part of the config in benchmark.net. So if you specify that you want 10 iterations of something, you're saying, take all the pieces of code I want to check, bundle them together and check them 10 times. The idea of this is that you may get slightly different results each time and that benchmark.net is then able to use a more varied result set to give you a final result. Now, the more important bit to understand is the processes it goes through when measuring the performance of your code. Benchmark.net goes through a pilot phase where it will choose the best amount of operations to run, and then it will go through an overhead warm-up and an overhead workload phase. So the overhead of Benchmark.net itself will be evaluated. This is really important because it means that we've accounted for the actual expense of using benchmark.net. And by expense, I mean the impact on performance. Benchmark.net then runs a warm up phase. So there's a warm up of the workload method. And then it does the actual measurements of your code. This is what it calls the actual workload. And for me, this is the really interesting part. Benchmark.net then produces a result based on the actual workload minus the median overhead. So it will, un it will calculate the median overhead from these other phases, and then it will subtract that from the actual workload result. After all this is done, benchmark.net will create a, an instance of the summary class, as you can see here, and it contains all the information about the benchmarks that have just been run. A series of files will be automatically created with the results, and you'll see a set of plots. Now we'll go into a little bit of detail about how you can use the configuration to manage this phase and the way things are ran. But for now, let's just take a look at benchmark.net in terms of getting started. So here I've got my trusty console application and I've got some logic that I want to benchmark and therefore analyze its performance. But before we start, we're gonna to have to actually install benchmark.net. So as usual, benchmark.net is available as a NuGet package. So I'm gonna head over to manage NuGet packages for solution and I'm gonna search for benchmark.net. Now, I'm using .NET 6, and this used to be called Benchmark.NET Core, but you can see here the package version is deprecated. So if this is the first one that you see, just click this link here. That will take you over to Benchmark.NET, and you can see this is the library that we're looking for. I'm going to go ahead and install this on my demo console application. And there we go. If I go to Dependencies and Packages, you can see benchmark.net is installed. Now there are some prerequisites we need to work through before we can actually start writing code to get this analysis running. So I'll step through them. Now the main prerequisite and really important one to remember, your build mode needs to be set to release. You can't set it to debug. The reason being that 
when you run something in debug, Visual Studio will use symbols. It will compile a lot of extra stuff that you don't want to have. You actually want to be able to benchmark this as if it was in the wild, as if it was production code. And so by setting it to release, we're getting as close as possible to what would be a real life scenario. You also need to take any of the code that you want to benchmark and put it in its own class. So in our case with a console application, we want to benchmark the encoding of some data to Base64. So I've put that logic into its own class called Base64 object. And within that, I've got a method called encode incoming data, and I want to benchmark this method. So let's just run through the actual logic itself, and then we'll start looking at how we can then benchmark that data using benchmark.net. So my base64 object class has been created here. I've got a private read-only string member here called data, and then I've created a string property which actually gets that data. We've got a constructor which receives data to encode, a string parameter, and then that's setting that read-only member on initialization. Then we've got the method that we actually want to benchmark. So we've got this method called encode incoming data. We're passing in incoming data, and then we're converting to a base64 string the bytes of that data. So we want to just understand how efficient this code is. Now there's a few things I want to change here because I don't think benchmark.net will let me pass parameters into my tests. So I'm actually gonna just change this constructor so that it is a parameterless constructor. And then I'm gonna change this to also be parameterless. And I'm gonna hard code data to hello world. Because for the most part, Whenever I've tested this, benchmark.net didn't like me passing parameters. There probably is a way of sending those parameters through. I've yet to find it, so if anyone does find it, hit me up in the comments below. So I'll put in data. So we'll just be saying the string we want to test with is hello world, and then we're gonna encode hello world here and get the benchmark results. Now it would probably be a bit more complex in a real world scenario. You would have multiple classes and you would have multiple methods and functions that you want to benchmark. And in particular, you may have a different way, in this case, of encoding the incoming data. You may then put those methods side by side and benchmark them in the same operation. You could also write one for decoding it to see if there's a difference between, or if there's a significant dif performance difference between encoding and decoding the base64 data. There's a few other prereqs we didn't go through. So by default, this program class for the console application is internal. We need this to be public. So benchmark.net needs these classes to be publicly accessible. I believe that's the same for the methods that we're benchmarking, but I'll just set that to public just in case. So there's a couple of namespaces that we want to add in order to be able to use benchmark.net. So I'm gonna say using benchmark.net, and then we want running. So this will allow us to actually use the benchmark runner and then we also want benchmark.net.attributes. Then we can use attributes to specify which code we actually want to benchmark. In our case, we want to benchmark encode incoming data. So I'm gonna put an attribute here called benchmark. Really is that simple when you wanna target specific methods. So how do we actually get this to run? So this is where we need to tell the main method how to run our benchmarks. So if you remember earlier in the video, I said that there's a benchmark runner, and there's also a summary instance that gets created. Well, we're actually gonna create that summary instance in the main method of our console app. So in main, I'm gonna say var summary, and then I'm gonna call the static benchmark runner and say dot run. And then because it takes a generic of T, you can specify the type you want to run benchmarks against. And this is why we've put them in their own class. So here I can put in the type that I want to run, which is base64 object. And that will then take any of the benchmark attributes and run benchmarks against the code that it's attributed to. So let's give this a quick go. I'm gonna say debug, and then I'm gonna click start without debugging. So that's another important point. We're gonna run in release, and we're gonna say start without debugging. And what you'll get is this console application window, 
and you'll start to see the phases that we talked about at the beginning of this video. So Benchmark.net will now build the project separately. It will then start to run its pilot phase, its overhead phase, and then go into the actual workload. So it's, there's the pilot, there's the overhead warm-up, the overhead actual. Now it's doing the warm-up against the workload that it needs to run. And then now it's running the actual workload that we've specified. So this is those actual benchmarks they're getting run. And there we go. So we're not benchmarking too many bits of code. So, you know, it doesn't take too long to run, but you can see we've got our result. And, and after going through those phases, we've got this table here, which is the main part we're interested in. So there was one method that we benchmarked. It was called encode incoming data, and it's provided three columns of results. So again, Back in the beginning of the video, we talked about how it gets to these results. It uses a formula, which is the overall overhead from benchmark.net taken away from the actual workload. And the result of that is that the mean benchmark is, or the mean result is 37.57 nanoseconds. So then we've got two other columns besides the mean, which is error and standard deviation. So the error column is a sample of half of a 99.9% .9 confidence level. So that will say that the mean is actually what we're saying it is. And the standard deviation is how much the results deviated from the actual mean that we've reported. So these two other columns I wouldn't say are critical it's just important to make sure you take note of them if there are high numbers there it means that you're getting some pretty inconsistent results but really what you want to see is that these numbers stay pretty static they say pretty low and the mean result is is what you're really concerned with so if i was in a situation say in a team where i wanted to understand you know whether we're using the most efficient code then i would put benchmark attributes against each of the methods that I want to look at, and then I would see a table with all those results, and I'd be able to sit down with my team and go through them and understand where we've got some efficiencies and some inefficiencies, and then from that you can start refactoring. You also get some file results that are automatically created. So if I go to open in this project, within the bin project, if you look at release, because it's release that we're working in, and then .NET 6, you should see a folder called benchmark.net artifact. So if I go to that, you'll also see a results folder, and the results of those most recent benchmarks will be outputted into various different file formats. So if I go to this one, we should see we've got an Excel file. So if I expand this out, we can see this was the method. It was a default kind of job. We'll talk about job types shortly. And then you can see all the different configs that were applied when that benchmark was run. So you can see the platform that we ran at, the runtime, and if we go all the way to the end, we can see that same set of columns that we saw in the console window. We've also got a HTML-based report, which should just be very similar to the console report. So if I just open that up in the browser, there we go. So you can see it's very similar to the console report, but you could use this to get the HTML source and then start putting that into other pages if you wanted to. And then we've also got a markdown version, which I've opened up in Visual Studio Code. And again, that's very similar to what we saw in the console window, but it's using markdown. So if you wanted to, you could post these on a GitHub page, say it was a open source project that you were working on and you wanted to put it as part of an issue, or if you were using some other kind of issue tracker that supports markdown. So you can see it gives you quite a lot of ways that you can report these results. Now there are some ways that you can change the configuration of the benchmark. So let's take a look at that. You can change these configurations through attributes once again, but usually the attributes are set at the class level for this. So at the top of base64 object, what I can do is specify the kind of job. Now I usually just go for simple job because it's simple. And within this, I can specify lots of different optional parameters. Now we talked about at the beginning of the video, the different phases that benchmark.net goes through. So there is a launch count. We could set that to a higher number so that it launches more than once. We could set the invocation or the target count to a higher number so that we get more benchmarks being run. I actually did this at quite a high level and I could hear the fans on my computer going a bit crazy. So you can tell that you're actually directly influencing the amount of benchmarks that are being run. So for example, if I say target count 20 and then run this again, we should see a slightly different behavior. So it's building the executable and so we should then start to see it warm up. So we've got our usual warm up and overhead. The workload warm up is now kicking in and now we've got the workload actual. So what we should see here is that the actual benchmark goes up to 20 
and there we go. So we've directly influenced the amount of iterations that happened on the actual benchmark of the code. Again, I'm going to change that to 50 and we'll see if we get any sort of deviation. So I'll just cut to running the actual workload and you can see we're going well above 40. We should be stopping at 50 because that was the total count that I specified. And there we go. So we've done 50 and we've got a slightly different result, but again, it's within a couple of nanoseconds. But you may find that you've got a very specific piece of logic that has different results every time it runs. I, I can't think of an example of what that would be, but if you did have an example like that, you could say, okay, I want to run a benchmark on this 100 times and see if that affects the result. And so you can set that with the total count. Now there's another concept as well called a run strategy. A run strategy is essentially the way benchmark.net runs the overall analysis. So the default, as we've just seen, is a run strategy called throughput. So that does the warm up phase, the overhead checking, all that sort of stuff before it does the actual benchmarking. So you can change your run strategy so that it does a slightly different approach in terms of the phases that it runs. For example, you could say to benchmark.net, I don't want you to run the pilot or warm up phase. And so there's a run strategy for that called cold startup. So I'm going to just remove this and say run strategy. So put that in as a named parameter and then it should be an enum. And you can see the different options and cold start would be the one we want and then I'll run it again. So you can see that it ran a lot quicker because it emitted a lot of the normal phases. So this actually gave us a very different result. So you can see here we've got the encoding incoming data method was measured with a mean time of 3.337 microseconds as opposed to nanoseconds. And you can see here there are some warnings here which say that the minimum observed iteration time is 900 nanoseconds which is, a, is very small. It's recommended to increase it to at least 100 milliseconds using more operations. So actually for a cold start, it's probably too fast. It's probably too small. And actually you would be fine using the, the normal throughput run strategy. So I would say for most situations, the default run strategy is fine. But if you've got a lot of operations and you want to just look at the very specific actual workload, then you could change your run strategy to cold start. Really for me, I think it doesn't matter too much because the main thing you're looking for is a consistent trend or pattern. So as long as you're using the same run strategy, that should give you consistent results. You can understand or you can answer the, the simple question, which way is faster or which parts of my code base are the less efficient. Now I've only really looked at the very basics of benchmark.net. As you can see here in the documentation, there's a lot of different configs that you can add and there's some more detailed explanations about the different terminology that's used. So we've talked about jobs, there's also columns. So you can set columns in the configuration as well. If you want to add specific columns to your benchmarks, you can do it here. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please leave me a comment and a like to say that the video was good. And if you didn't find it useful, then let me know. I want to find out where I'm going wrong. But more importantly, please subscribe to the channel. I'm getting so close to a thousand subscribers. I can't wait to get there with your help. And I will see you soon for more .NET goodness.